So I'm really pleased to welcome um, Alex Stevens uh, to another Corona Conversation. Alex, do you just want to tell people um, what you do and, and where you are today? Yes, um, I'm a criminologist, a professor in criminal justice at the University of Kent. I'm sitting in my kitchen, I'm stuck at home trying to organise online teaching at the moment. Okay, that sounds, yeah, a challenge, but as we know, probably not compared to the challenges that so many yeah. people out there are facing. So um, today is Thursday the 26th of March. We're about yeah. 10 days, two weeks into kind of the pandemic. Can you give people an idea of what's going on in the UK and what the government's response has been, particularly as it, you know, relates to people with issues related to drugs and alcohol? Well, the government's response has been pretty minimal in terms of how it relates to people with drugs and alcohol. Understandably, they're caught up in a rising tide of COVID cases amongst the general population, which is expected to peak in two to two and a half weeks, with the possibility of overwhelming the NHS. And the needs of the most vulnerable people in society are at higher risk of being ignored. Which does seem rather perverse. I, don't, I think the government's trying to give such a clear message, which is stay in, because don't become sick because, because you'll overwhelm the NHS. But you're right. The population that we work with uh, are some of the most vulnerable people who won't be able to self-isolate. And if that group become unwell, they will be at huge risk of dying and they will overwhelm the NHS. So it makes good policy to start investing and making sure they're safe. Absolutely, but I mean, this was a need before COVID hit. Um, the UK already has a public health emergency with drug-related deaths, with over 4,000 people dying of drug-related um, poisonings in the most recent year we have um, data for. And that's probably only, maybe even less than half of the people in that group who are dying of other chronic health conditions, including um, serious pulmonary problems, which give them problems breathing and getting in oxygen, even before that group, which is highly vulnerable to catching COVID-19. So even before this, we should have been investing more in drug treatment services and innovating more in drug treatment services by expanding heroin-assisted treatment alongside optimising dosage and duration for more traditional forms of opioid substitution treatment. And we should already have set up drug consumption rooms where people who are the most vulnerable could take illicit substances and have their health protected. What this pandemic does is make the needs for those types of services even more urgent. But if we weren't looking after those people at a time of out, without crisis and where perhaps you know, there was money available, what possible chance is there that the government's going to take this opportunity to start investing in that group? Well, I must say I'm not optimistic. Um, the complete failure of the government to follow ACMD recommendations on reducing opioid-related deaths, um, of which the most important recommendation in 2016 was to make, at least maintain investment in opioid substitution treatment. That recommendation has not been followed. Indeed, um, funding for those services at local authority level has been cut by at least a quarter over the last three or four years. And so I'm not optimistic that the government is belatedly going to discover uh, a sense of decent humanity and compassion for the people who are most vulnerable in our society, which is, I think makes it important for those people who know what's going on. Um, and I'm, I'm including that people who've got drug problems, academic researchers like myself, doctors and healthcare workers, people working in drug treatment services. It makes it even more important that we raise our voices and draw attention to the urgent need um, of the people who are most vulnerable. And this isn't just, as you mentioned, because those people are amongst the most likely people to catch COVID and die of it because of their underlying health problems. But because, as you say, um, the pragmatic extra burden that will place on not just the NHS, but other services that are struggling to cope at the moment. I mean, one of the things as, as a clinician that always frustrates me is there are so many, so many people out there who are not on effective doses of opiate substitution treatment. And there is a part of me that kind of hopes that with the possibility of heroin supplies running out, that this might be an opportunity for treatment services to say to people, you've been hanging around on 40 milligrams for years, you've been using two or three times a week, that supply might dry up. Now is the time really to optimize your dose. And so perversely, a bunch of people actually might for the first time get on really good doses, which suppresses their craving and their use and protects them against overdose. That assumes that the doctors are prescribing have the time and the inclination to spend the time working with patients in order to optimise their doses. Um, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? In the last 
heron drought we had in the UK, which was between 2010 and 2012, we did see a reduction in deaths from heroin as those supplies reduced and people either reduced their use of heroin or moved to other substances. We saw, for example, a slight increase in methadone deaths at the time, suggesting people were moving from one substance to the other. So there is an opportunity here to reduce some of the harms that are being done by heroin to that population. But the big danger, I suppose, is that if people start moving not to methadone, but moving to, that's prescribed to them, but moving to fentanyls that might get into the supply, because at a time when it is harder for traffickers to move packages of substances around the postal system, around trade networks which are closing down, it'll be easier for them to move small quantities of fentanyl than large quantities of heroin. That's the big unknown in the current supply shock that's happening. We're seeing supplies of heroin on the street dry up, supplies of spice coming in from China seems to have dried up as well. We just gotta hope that the supplies of fentanyl from China are also reducing because the thing we don't want to see is fentanyl getting into the heroin market at this time when people will be searching for substitutes for their usual. And I think they will be searching on, on the dark net as well, where they'll actually have a range of other products. And I guess I'm also concerned about the potential displacement to prescription opioids. Um, yeah. you know, and, and the kind of chaotic mix of, of poly CNS suppressant use and pre-gabs and benzos and tramadol as people struggle yeah. to get through. And that then increases your risk of overdose again. And Which is exactly why we should be seeking to get more people into treatment rather than pushing them away from treatment, um, which can happen when the NHS is diverting its attentions elsewhere. I mean, it would be, I mean, there are some parts of London where you can get into treatment same day, but there are parts of the UK where without COVID, there were still weeks and weeks before you can get into treatment. What do you think the likelihood is that the government might loosen the reins on prescribing policy to really implement low threshold prescribing to bring prescribing and treatment in a way that suits patients and not as it historically does suiting those people who run clinics? Well, I think there is evidence of people at local level taking necessary actions, for example, to reduce restrictions on take home um, prescribing or supervised consumption so that people don't have to be moving around and putting themselves and others at risk. And I hope that if we can see as the crisis develops and perhaps subsides, that people will see, well, it's perhaps some of those restrictions we were imposing on people weren't necessary. But I'm not optimistic that in the next few weeks that people will have enough time or resource to create the specialist services that people would need in order to get them into low threshold services. I mean, one option that I'm talking to with a few people about is trying to ramp up the capacity for telehealth prescribing um, to support frontline workers to make it easier for people to come in. And, and there might be that capacity. Yeah. Well, I spoke to Zara Snap the other day and, and she said, in the same way Steve Rolls did, that they thought that when all of this is over, governments may have learned lessons around treating people with drug problems with more respect and realizing that by making treatment more available and more user focused, there are incredible benefits. Can you see potentially there are some longer term benefits that might come out of this? Well, you've got to hope so, haven't you, that people will realize that we need more integration in the system and we need more capacity in the system. I think that's going to be a lesson learned across the healthcare system for COVID-19 that you can't run a healthcare service at under capacity in normal times and then expect it to cope when there's an emergency. And that applies to the general NHS and that certainly applies to drug services which are now scrambling to try and catch up with the needs of their clients which they were already failing to meet because of systematic underfunding over the last 10 years. So we need the lesson we need is that we need spare capacity and better integrated services in normal times, which can then flex to meet extra needs when emergencies happen. What, what do you think the impact might be on moving towards more formalised decriminalisation in, in many countries? Because at, at this point, I'm assuming most police aren't going to be wasting their time trying to arrest people for possession. And the world won't fall apart if you stop doing that. Is that a lesson they could learn? Well, that's a lesson we already could have learned. Um, what we've seen from the many examples where drugs possession has either been depenalised or decriminalised. So either the police have stopped enforcing existing laws or countries have changed their law in order to make it no longer an offence or criminal offence um, to possess these substances. We've not seen dramatic increases in use or related harms. So the message for right now is that police forces could quite safely stop 
um, arresting and punishing people for simple possession of drugs without any intention to supply. Um, and we wouldn't see any harms occurring from that because the evidence suggests that that's not an effective way of spending police resources. The interesting thing is what, what might happen if the police also decide to stop deprioritize, to, to deprioritize low level supply offenses. Many of the people involved in those low level supply offenses are people who, got, who have themselves got um, problems with drugs who could better be dealt with by getting them into low threshold responsive services that would reduce their need to be generating income by drug dealing. And so if we can start learning, learning that we need to be reaching out to people and bringing them into services, bringing them into social integration, rather than pushing them away through criminalising and punishing them, then that is a lesson we could learn now, just as we should learn it all the time. And, and so by reducing any potential criminal penalties for people, which are often barriers to people coming into treatment, the police will also be doing people a favour because they might feel more confident that they could get treatment. Well, the police would be doing those people a favour um, because they'd not be imposing the harms and costs of a criminal record upon them. They wouldn't be putting them in situations where they're more likely to be harmed, such as prison, which is a pretty dangerous environment to be in at the moment. But they'd also be doing themselves a favour because they'd be, be, be focusing their resources on things where they actually can make a difference, both in, in promoting community safety and reducing crime. There's no, not much evidence that criminalising people for drug possession actually does that. So why the police keep on doing that is more of a political question than it is in terms of police effectiveness. So I think many police services, as we've seen in the UK and other countries, have realised that and have implemented processes to divert people away from um, criminalisation and prosecution, even when governments like our government in the UK have been reluctant to change the law. Hmm. I mean, both um, Matt Southwell and Zara highlighted the potential important role for low-level dealers at a time of this sort of crisis, where if you bang up those low-level dealers, that puts further pressure on people seeking treatment. But Matt also spoke about some of those dealing networks acting as secondary NSP providers. And, you know, there was the example of, you know, the gangs in the favelas in Brazil saying, we want you all to stay away. I mean, there are some unusual alliances that mm -hmm. we're seeing at the moment. And the one thing that's very clear from the people I've spoken to is the drug using community has been far quicker to act than any government because they've always had to look after themselves. And well, that's, the, that's the history of harm reduction, isn't it? Harm reduction started by drug users looking after themselves. And so that's what we'd expect to see in this situation as well. Um, but it's a big political ask to get politicians and senior police officers to see the benefits of working with drug suppliers rather than continue to work against them. Yeah, and I'd, I'd appreciate there's lower hanging fruit, of fruit, like expanding treatment services, reducing barriers to getting in. But it was just a novel idea that those groups often yep. supply needles to people. And, yep. you know, if needles dry up, then you've got, you know, hep C, HIV, a whole bunch of other problems that, you know, catch healthcare systems when COVID is, you know, nothing more than yep. a, a next series. Yeah, but I think if you talk to people in the Home Office and the National Crime Agency, they're more likely to focus on the potential benefits of restricting supply of heroin. Now, people in the field might feel that's, you know, a, a pretty, you know, the, the redundant argument. But they would have it on their side that, you know, there's been reductions in deaths in previous heroin droughts. But that, to, if we are going to turn that situation into a benefit, it does mean that we need to flood the availability of drug treatment services. If people are going to be looking for alternative supplies because the heroin um, has dried up, then we need to make it available to them to come into treatment and be treated with respect, with dignity, not infantilized or patronized, but given the health and other services they need. And if we can do that at this time, then we've got a chance of making something good happen out of this terrible emergency. I mean, you're, you're making me so depressed, Alex, because everything you're saying that I'm asking in the context of COVID is you just saying it's just offering people good quality treatment in the way we always should have done. And it shouldn't have taken yeah. a crisis to get people to be focused on the needs of people who are using and have a bit of humanity and, and respect. But mm. I think that's well, maybe- As I said at the start, we're all, we, we, we were already in an emergency of drug related deaths. The Health and Social Care Select Committee of House of Commons, the Scottish Affairs Committee, many people in the field, there's been editorials in the Lancet calling this a public health emergency or drug-related death, even before that was overlaid by the pandemic of COVID-19. And you're absolutely right, these are lessons we should have learned before, um, and we should still be learning even more urgently right now.
so, so, so maybe, maybe just to finish off, I guess that all the people that we work with, one of the really important things that we need to do is to make sure the lessons that have been reinforced now are not forgotten at the time when there is the resources and space to then start providing you know, effective treatment in a way that people want. Because that would be the yeah. real tragedy, is we get yeah. through this and then everyone goes, we'll just continue as we did. Yeah, and I think one of the ways of doing that is to lend our support to the voices of people who use, who use drugs, who have this experience, who can tell much quicker than we can what's going on the ground, and to give them platforms and space to make their own case for being treated, as you say, with compassion, humanity and dignity. And one of the things I would ask for anyone who has a drug problem, who is watching this now, we want this to be a platform for everyone to have a voice from um, across the spectrum, doesn't matter what region you are, but if you're a provider or someone with a lived experience, there would be a really valuable story to tell. You know, maybe you've come up with some smart ways of getting around your shortage. I don't know, but we want that to be a platform for everyone. Alex, thank you so much for your time. Um, get back no to doing your um, online teaching, your poor bugger, and um, yeah. Yeah, stay healthy, safe, and away from everyone else. And you, Adam. <laughs> All right. Cheers, Cheers, mate. Cheers. Bye. Bye. And so the question that you chose to ask Will it be better where we're going? And though the answer I don't know for a fact Still my heart is saying, oh yeah Still just taking it one day at a time Still don't know what I'm trying to find Really I don't mind, cause I'll be fine Yeah, I'll be fine